<laughs> Someone mic'd over here. <laughs> All right, thank you. Go ahead and start. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Did you, are you <laughs> recording? Yeah. We're going to record this session and post it on the website later for your review or if you miss something that you wanted to go back to, we're going to have this all recorded. All the slides are going to be up on the website as well, so don't worry about catching all the information with on the slides. We're, they're, they're posted already up on our website, and we'll go through the website, etc. Thank you. Okay, great. There's other. representatives here from about 60 of the 63 jurisdictions that are participating uh, in, uh, in the plan. They're here at the meeting, either in this room or viewing on YouTube, uh, as I said. Uh, we also have representatives from several different stakeholder agencies in attendance and welcome uh, as well. Uh, we're going to cover a variety of topics this morning, uh, from project <coughs> scope and schedule, public outreach, for the plan and the planning process itself. Um, today's meeting is also an opportunity for you to meet face to face with uh, staff from Dynamic Planning for Science. Uh, they're the consultant that will be updating the plan. Uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions of uh, staff and the staff will have a chance to check in with you as well, which I believe they've been doing throughout the morning already. Um, some of you uh, that are plan participants have taken deeper dives into the plan uh, as you've applied for FEMA Hazard Mitigation Assistance Grant Fund. Uh, some of you are new to the plan, totally new to the plan, although your jurisdictions are long-time participants. Uh, the stakeholders are part of uh, a group that includes subject matter experts in planning, public works, property valuation, GIS, engineering, Blood plan administration, risk management, and public communications. So as you can tell, there's a lot of moving parts to this whole process. <coughs> uh, so let's begin. I'm going to introduce you to the team from Dynamic Planning for Science. Uh, they're the consultants we'll be working with to update the plan. We've got Ethan Mobley here. He's the founder and co-owner of Dynamic Planning. Uh, he has a background, Ethan has a background in architecture, engineering, and large-scale planning efforts. He has worked as a FEMA and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers support contractor on some of the nation's most important infrastructure projects. He now leads 
hazard mitigation planning efforts for local clients, specifically in California. He's conducted multi-jurisdictional pro projects for San Bernardino County, uh, as you know, the largest county in the nation, and others across California. Also with us today is Brian Greer, who is the co-owner and data visualization manager of Dynamic Planning. Uh, Brian leads the da data visualization risk assessment team on all hazard mitigation planning projects. He has a background in cartography and data sciences. Uh, Ethan and Brian have been working together in this industry for 10 years, creating various products in the emergency management sector. Brian has worked for large and small engineering firms with diverse specialties. And so at this point, I will hand it over to Ethan Mosley. Ethan. Thank you guys for having us. I'm really excited to be here. I think this is the pinnacle of hazard mitigation planning, I think. Thanks, Wendy, for all the lights and glory. Um, I appreciate it. Um, we're going to slow roll this thing. Uh, there's a lot of different folks in the room with a lot of different backgrounds. We can speak the language of a lot of different disciplines, but however, we need to roll in the same direction and understand how we're going about this together while you're in the room. I'm going to uh, introduce that subject matter today and the reasons why you're important to every piece of this pie and as we move forward with the planning effort. Um, there is participating jurisdictions, which means something different than stakeholders. Um, if you can raise your hand if you're a participating jurisdiction, a formal participating jurisdiction as part of this plan, <coughs> a representative of such, raise them higher. Okay, so about half the folks in the room are formally here, invited here to assemble part of the plan. The other um, folks in the room, the stakeholders, are here to help coordinate and help give guidance to those participating stakeholders. So I really appreciate you being here. Please ask questions as I roll through these slides. It's really important that we understand the intent. The slides are going to be um, up on the website. We're going to go through a website. Um, we're going to do this poll EV stuff so we can pull a larger audience. There's folks online. That's why I'm speaking to a phone right now. Um, we have, we're sharing a screen, we're recording this event, it's up on YouTube. Um, so there's all different <coughs> types of avenues that we can display information and we're trying to do our best to do such. So it's, um, you know, some of it's um, a little touchy for the technology, but we'll try our best. So if, if anybody on the phone, please um, chat, um, let Brian know that you can't hear us. YouTube folks, please say something if you can't hear us. Um, We'll, we'll try to make our best to make and improve it as we move forward through the meeting. So I'm just going to go through the agenda real quick. Um, you can share the agenda. So what we're going to be talking about, we're not going to do a, a full introduction today. This, that would take quite a bit of time, 15 minutes or so with all the people here. Um, but we're, what we're going to do is we're going to define the mitigation planning process. Um, some of the, uh, we're going to set some expectations, why, why you're here, what, what are we going to ask you to do over the next six months. Um, we're trying to finish this planning process, at, at least for the meetings, um, by the new year. So we're going to meet uh, together again for another three times to get consensus amongst the group. But however, we'll be working um, individually with the participating jurisdictions and we're going to help you um, through this process. So we'll give you a jurisdictional lead from our our, um, our firm to help you manage the process and record it and make sure that we're doing all the right things. But when we come together, um, we want to record our consensus amongst groups uh, uh, as well as the participating jurisdictions. We're going to go through the planning process, um, re the schedule, and some of FEMA's requirements as part of that planning process, and some of the grant act uh, This is basically a glorified grant program, and in order to get to this grant money, we need to meet like this every five years and come up with a planning process and record it to make sure that we can refresh a plan every five years to maintain eligibility for this grant program. So the, the grant program is called Hazard Mitigation Assistance. There's a couple different pots of money under that program. I'm going to talk about each one. You might fall asleep in that um, segment. That's the time to use the restroom because those slides will be available. Um, there's a couple different <coughs> colors of money. There's post-disaster and pre-disaster funding that's out there, that's been out there since 2000 and before. So I'm going to start to um, educate yourselves on, or I'm going to start to educate you on some of that uh, grant opportunities that are available now and will be in the future. 
And we'll also um, look at a website. We'll review some of the content on that website. And then some of the outreach that's required. So we're gonna, we've posted a lot of information for you to reuse. And um, when we're showing mitigate hazards, that's for you guys um, to reuse, recan. There's no proprietary rights on this thing. You can copy and paste anything you want off this website and get it onto your own jurisdictional pages. So we'll go through that. And then we'll go through some next steps. Um, and and it, please ask questions if, um, when, when they arise. So some important website material. So mitigatehazards.com. That's a really important website. We already have a website built. Um, mitigatehazards.com forward slash county of Kern. There is a password on that website. And it's pass you need to be password protected. And that password is incorrect. I'm sorry. Kern 2020. Kern 2020. <laughs> And then we're going to use this pollev.com forward slash dynamic planning on um, today. I'm going to try to understand what, you, um, what some of the hazards are that you're concerned with, some of your perceptions um, of where I should eat for dinner. Um, so we have some questions like that, some little icebreaker questions, but we're going to use pollev.com forward slash dynamic planning. So some important, again, mitigatehazards.com, and we'll review that website. Um, very shortly. So there's a, there's a larger team. I have, uh, we're a micro small business in California. There's five of us. However, we have some of the most specialty um, staff members out there for mitigation and mitigation planning. Um, you're talking to half the, our, our firm. We're very accessible. We take on small, not small projects, but we take on individual projects so we can give it individualized attention to, to these types of activities. So we don't take on a lot of load, and so that therefore we can provide individualized attention. Uh, right now, we're finalizing the um, San Bernardino Unified School District Hazard Mitigation Plan. We've been successful in getting them grants and getting them going on some grant programs. Uh, they recently applied for uh, grants to um, basically modifies uh, 28 drainage basins across their school district sites. They were approved. We're going through the application process now to further um, develop their, their grant application and, and eventually get the FEMA funding that was uh, allocated after a disaster. So we are working in this area. We work for San Bernardino County. We're working for, we're finalizing Napa County's plan right now. And that's a, a multi-jurisdictional plan as well. So we have specialty um, planning staff we have specialty risk assessment staff and outreach staff. So those are the kind of the three buckets that we'll be working with you through is um, planning staff, the risk assessment staff like Brian, and then outreach. So the, the out, outreach is a big component. There's a couple requirements for outreach as we roll through this process. Some outreach and entails stakeholder development like this, but also reaching out to the public and informing them, hey, this is what we're doing. And this is how we can support you in mitigation in your home. So what we always try to make sure is we have a clear message and we start doing outreach as soon as we're educated as a group together first. So it's a, it's a significant component. Um, we spend a lot of time on outreach and making sure we can get the word out there, what you can do in the home, what the county's doing to protect their assets as well, or the districts, et cetera. So we, we have quite a bit of background. Like I said before, we can speak languages for you know, public works, the sheriff department, um, any kind of um, color of uniform you're wearing, we could really speak to the, um, you and how this um, really relates to your staff. And so as we roll through this, we'll try to make sure that you understand it as it relates to your district uh, or your municipality, et cetera. <coughs> So I'm going to go through a couple poll, um, another poll EV questions if you guys can get on your phones again or your computers. I'm going to go through some icebreaker questions to make sure you understand how to use the polling device. And um, I'll get back to that and share the screen. Just give me one moment. As, as I'm giving you um, the opportunity, please try to go to pollev.com. And it's, in, it's on your screen. It was the first question that was up there, but I'm going to try to do it again here.
How excited are you to be involved in this planning process? Is it a heck yeah? <laughs> Just let, let me know if you have a problem getting on and raise your hand and we can get over there. It's over there, Brian. We'll, we'll slow roll this. We got a lot of time. So don't worry, don't panic. Got another one over here. And you can use your phones as well. Okay. So the, the, the questions will get a little bit more interesting. We're, we're, um, we have about 13 questions today, but I want to see how you guys like it first before we start integrating this more often in, in our other meetings. I hope that this attendance is consistent throughout. Um, I forgot to mention, as uh, this is a grant process. This was funded under a grant. The county applied for um, a planning grant under disaster 4305. Is that right? 4305. And as part of that process, we need to do in-kind services. And there's quite a bit of in-kind match um, instead in lieu of cash. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that we can maintain our audience levels and maintain our participation. It helps with the planning process, it helps with the facilitation, but it also helps with the in-kind services. So please, this is really important as Wendy alluded to in all of her emails beforehand that it's really important that we capture this in-kind services and your services. I appreciate you being here. Um, it's, it's really important that we maintain this, uh, the meeting uh, attendance. And if you can't attend in person, we'll give you the opportunity to attend digitally, but I wanted to make sure that we can all kind of play together with this pull EV device and see if we can get our thoughts together here. Anybody else having problems? So we got 42% heck yes. Woo! <laughs> all right. That's cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, we can lock that one down. No, there's more. We got more icebreakers here. Did, um, were you involved in the last mitigation planning effort? <coughs> yes or no? Even as a stakeholder, if you're, you're formerly participating <coughs> jurisdiction now and you were a stakeholder, please let us know. Wow. This is why we do this every five years. There's a lot of turnover. It's a new subject matter for a lot of you guys. So basically, we're starting um, from first grade, probably, right? We're going to get to high school by the time we're done with these four meetings. For those online, um, please, uh, on the screen share that we have going on, please uh, chat to Brian if you're having problems and he can help you out. What's the best place for dinner in Kern County? <laughs> you can type it in. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you haven't signed in yet, please sign in. And if you haven't got a notebook, please raise your hand. We have notebooks. that Italian? Yeah, I think so. Sounds good. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? What's the ranch? What's the ranch? I mean, it has some project information. Yeah. Thank you. Are we all good on the video? We're good? Okay, good.
<laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> Taco Bell's always on top one too. <laughs> yeah. No. No, pure meat is fine. All right. Uh, people are still answering. Forgotties. All right, we're gonna have our meeting at Forgotties next time. <laughs> is that expensive? <laughs> it's expensive. Okay. You guys like the expense? You have rich taste, right? <laughs> okay. We can go to the next. I'm gonna go ahead and lock this down. Okay, uh, where are you originally from? Just click the map. These are all exercises to help you with the additional exercises later. So where were you born, basically, where you came from? Or where your roots are? You're v Virginians. I used to live in Alexandria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that like Roanoke? Is that Roanoke? <laughs> Richmond? Okay. <laughs> We're all right. Pretty cool, right? We're going to use this um, tool next meeting to pick our earthquake scenario we're going to run. So we're going to run some earthquake scenarios, and we're going to pick which one you want us to run based upon the the, the shake maps and some of the intensities yet that you may see. Um, so we're going to use this at a later date, but it's kind of cool to see this. Okay, and this one you're going to drag up and down. So we're going to drag your, you're going to categorize your favorite safari animal by dragging the, the bar up and down. So click on the bar and move it up and down. You guys getting it? There you go. Yeah. So we're going to drag it. So click on the bar and drag it. There you go. Congratulations, you made it to second grade. This one's a fun one, right? The lion, Peta. <laughs> my gift to all my friends is that little giraffe when they're having kids, that little baby toy. Yeah. It's pretty popular. It's like a $60 giraffe. <coughs> I don't know what. It's supposed to stimulate like sight and um, teething and stuff like that. All right. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll go back. Don't answer this one, that's for later. I'm sorry, the fun's over. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so, mitigation planning. It's a pretty big topic right now in the United States. Um, we're seeing a lot more often disasters that are occurring. We've had five declared disasters this year in 2019 in California alone. And so it's a big topic right now across the United States, across FEMA, DHS, and across um, the National Building Institute for, for Public Safety. So I want to roll through some of this information uh, on mitigation planning, the importance of it, and why we're doing it today, why you're here. Um, so mitigation planning defined by FEMA, sustained action taken, um, to reduce uh, or eliminate long-term risk to life and property. Um, it's basically manipulating the built environment, so manipulating your buildings, your fr flood control structures, um, to eliminate or curb that damage um, and curb the rebuild cycle. So damage, rebuild, damage, rebuild. We want to we want to re damage and then rebuild better, so it doesn't damage again. So that's the concept of mitigation planning or 
doing mitigation projects or actions, so that sustained action taken to reduce long-term damage to, to your buildings, to, your, to um, reduce injury to your residents. Um, we want to build stronger, think defensively, um, we, and we could do that through um, the built environment, through building codes, and we'll, we'll go through some of that. But this is a, an example here of a client um, we worked with about five years ago. This is Solano County. Um, this is their dispatch and 911 center that was flooded. So um, this is at their courthouse. Um, uh, the, the picture above is floodgates that were built with um, rubber membranes. And it, it took a human being to come out there and deploy those floodgates onto the courthouse walls to protect the courthouse, the dispatch center, and the jail from flooding. It may, it's a really good idea, right? I would, I would probably build that in my home to, to reduce flooding, but there's, there's one piece to this pie that he needed to get a text message or a phone call to deploy these. He was out of town, he didn't get to the text message, and they didn't deploy the flood walls, the floodgates, and the 911 center, dispatch center, and the jail were flooded. That, that was a lot of damage. Um, if we would have spent a little bit more money in the front end to do active deployment for floodgates. There's automatic <coughs> floodgates now that float upon receiving floodwaters. There's cisterns that you can install that are long-term solutions. This might have cost the, the county you know, a couple thousand to build, but if they would have spent a little bit more money, they could uh, reduce that damage and that displacement cost um, that occurred as part of that, that, um, that flood event. This was in 2007. So there was a big, big flood event in 2007. I don't know if you remember it um, in the Bay Area. Um, it happens almost about t every 10 years, the flooding events here in California. Uh, 2017, 2018, that was a big flood year. Uh, we're still getting a, um, some flood um, this year. But I just wanted to have you start to think <laughs> about the long-term solutions, not the, the band-aids and the fixes that we put on our houses. Um, think about fire-resistant material. Um, all those types of things that we can do to reduce the damage um, from, from natural hazards. So I'm going to give you a little um, so background on the hazard mitigation assistance program. There's a different colors of money, but this started in 1988. And um, after 1988, the, the program initiated, but they thought that we needed better planning processes in place to help us align our resources as communities to the grant program. And so in 2000, they said, you need to have a hazard mitigation plan in place in order to receive this grant funding. So that's why we're here today. Uh, it's called DMA 2000, Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000. So we have to have this planning process in place to be eligible for grant funding activity at a later date. This is, this is uh, we gotta get to the carrot we got to do this every five years to maintain eligibility. So you might hear me say, say DMA 2000 today. That means that we're, that's the requirements that we're after and um, abiding by as we go through this planning process. This is the um, Kern County's effort started in 2012, last go around. It was finally uh, approved in March of 2014. Is that right? Somewhere? September. September, September. September of 2014. So it takes quite a, a long time to um, get the plan approved. And so we're at that five-year cycle now. We're pretty close. We, got, we have an extension uh, that was granted by FEMA. It takes a while to get everybody in the room. It takes uh, a while for the county to get our consulting services uh, underway. So we're, we're in that process now. This was all funded by a grant. So this is a continued cycle of grant um, processes. Um, Wendy applied for a planning grant and got the grant, and that's why we're here today as well. So we're not, we have very little out-of-pocket costs to continue this planning and this planning cycle. Anybody have any questions? Okay, you're in third grade now. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, why have, it, why have a mitigation plan, not just the planning process? Why, uh, why have a plan? It reduces, again, the exposure for the county and the city assets, district assets. We're going to run an awesome risk assessment for every participating jurisdiction in, in this room, as opposed to the last iteration where we had you know, a, a pretty weak risk assessment. We're going to improve that risk assessment so you know <coughs> how many structures, how much value, how many people are at risk within each one of your district boundaries. So we can start to plan a little better 
We may not want to focus on flood. We may want to focus on wildfire for the folks up in the hills. So we can start to see the differences between the risk that's out there, almost like what an insurance agent would do for your property, your individual property. We're going to start to do that for the districts and the, and the municipalities. So we're going to, um, it's going to contain specific information to support applications. So that's a really important, that risk assessment is going to contain, hey, I got this many people at this location at risk of flooding. Here's my application for the flood control structure, et cetera, et cetera. So it's gonna, we're going to have more detail to ensure that we can get this plan activated. Um, we're going to ensure that we have uh, safe development in future years. We're aligning that, um, our efforts with the general plan effort that's going on through Kern County. We'll start to look at some of your, um, your municipality uh, general plan safety elements, aligning those elements to make sure that we're not putting people at risk and identifying that risk early and often. I have a few slides on that. And then think of it as a capital improvements plan for hazard mitigation. So think of it as those improvements that need to be done to reduce and buy down that risk. So it's a physical plan, but also there might be some sprinkled elements of emergency services. We need more training here. Training is not really a, an activity that's funded by the, the grant program, but it, they really want you to think about it as a, an additional planning effort. I really would like to get our training wheels back on and make sure that we understand what the intent of the program is as we roll through this and then start adding those additional concepts on after we, we um, fulfill our duties over the next five years. So there's three types. This is very, um, this is, um, there, this is the basic overview of mitigation planning. There's a very long guide, guidance document. Um, there's a how-to guide. I'm going to give you the short version to make sure that we all understand what we're trying to do as part of this process. There's a lot of code of federal regulations, 201.6B, 201.6C. I really want to pay attention to the concepts today to un have you understand and have you communicate what the, um, your understanding to the, the, to the public and, and your colleagues. So what we're trying to do with mitigation planning is change the threat, change the impact, and change the victim. And I have a few slides on each one of these. We'll go through this, but I really want to, <coughs> and, and it builds resiliency through mitigation and mitigation planning. And mitigation planning could involve actions and projects. And so I'm going to go through some of these items. So changing the impact. <coughs> the impact we could change it by understanding what the impacts could be, right? So understanding if we can analyze the hazard a little bit better to understand, hey, we have higher fuels in this area over here, we might want to attack this area first. We're, so we're understanding the hazard. As part of that, it could be an earthquake hazard. If we can understand what kind of damage an earthquake can do in an area or the potential damage an earthquake could have in an area, we understand what kind of building codes or what kind of structures need to be improved. So th there's a few pictures on the right um, that kind of display what kind of cha changing the impact. Uh, emergency management and evacuation planning, that's changing the impact, right? Um, hazard specific planning, warning and forecasting systems. Um, USGS has a warning system now that you, they can tell you in advance of when an earthquake is going to hit. Within about 40 seconds, they, they have a warning system they know that they can, they, they can sense the tremors down below and we have 40 seconds to respond. So they're trying to get better at forecasting and forecasting systems. Uh, National Weather Service, is anybody here from representing National Weather Service? No? They have a 10 day forecast now. That's incredible. Um, that, that's way more than we had uh, 20 years ago. They're getting way better at modeling and forecasting weather events. And so we can get that update um, early and often so we can start warning uh, folks about flooding or potential flooding. And then under that same change the impact, that professional tr training and development. So uh, getting your, um, your red card for wildfire suppression, um, all, ki all kinds of different activities could fall under that. But what we need to understand, not all of these activities are eligible under this gr grant program. So we're, if we need to add to, if, if there's a big gap in these areas, that you can identify as we go through this process, it's, we need to understand that that gap may not be filled with this grant program. It may be filled with other buckets that we need to identify. <coughs> Changing the threat. 
uh, channel improvements and maintenance, urban interface, fuel reduction, retention basin improvements, air flow spoilers on power lines, public building improvements. Most of these activities under changing the threat is, is mitigation that uh, can be and will be funded by the hazard mitigation grant program. So most of these changing the, in the threat, that's really what they're after as part of this program. So this is a shaded fuel break. So these pro th this type of activity is definitely funded under HMGP or PDM, or pre-disaster mitigation dollars. So changing the threat, retention basins, flood control structures, um, seismic retrofits for public utilities. That's changing the threat. And then changing the victim. This is what we're seeing a lot uh, across the country right now. We're seeing a lot of victims of flooding and wildfire. So uh, zoning and restrictions on new construction. Building better, building smarter, right? Um, acquisition and relocation of structures. FEMA funds that under F flood mitigation assistance. So we can do buyouts for, uh, for homes that have been repetitively flooded, that build and that, that damage and rebuild, that damage and rebuild, damage and rebuild. Well, we're tired of that. And it's making the, the <coughs> National Flood Insurance Program go bankrupt. So let's, let's build smarter. Let's acquire those properties that have been flooded or move those houses that have been flooded um, a number of different times. And then also changing the, the victim is the public information and training. How, how can the CERT team provide more outreach? How can we help you provide more outreach? Where can you provide it better? That, that hazard analysis is going to help you do targeted outreach to the facilities that are really at risk. And there's all kinds of um, resources out there that helps the homeowner. I'm going to show you some of those resources we've started to develop on our website for specifically for Kern. But I really would appreciate if that CERT team do, you know, help us engage the public and help us get that information out there. But change the victim, regardless if it's a human or your, your, your ranching communities. Um, I consider you know, cattle a victim in, in situations for flooding. Um, did you know that cattle can swim? They can swim up to up to 24 hours. Isn't that crazy? But um, they can't outrun a wildfire that's moving 45 miles an hour and 1,000 degrees. So let's get, let's get ahead of these, um, these, these natural hazards. Let's, let's um, do a better job of forecasting. Let's do a better job of the analysis and do a better job of doing that outreach. Um, that's, that's part of that mitigation planning. The importance of mitigation, again, this is kind of a, this is like, yeah, this paradise. This is the importance right here. We need to build smarter, we need to build better, and we need to build defensively. We need, um, and the importance of this is saved lives, lives re, uh, reduction in, in disaster recovery costs, property loss reduction, social disruption, and it's, it's quite, it, we're seeing it more and more, more and more. The, you know, um, I don't, I don't uh, know your political polls or whatever, but climate change has caused a lot of these, um, these disasters to occur more frequently. We have drier, hotter years, we have wetter, um, more frequent storms. And, and so we don't know what's coming up and, and how to make sure that, oh, yeah. Um, so we just, we, we need to pay attention to what's going on with our environments and make sure that we're, we're moving forward in the right direction. And this, everybody in this room can help us do that. Any questions? Okay, we're in fourth grade. But this is really kind of serious stuff. It's, um, but I, I really appreciate you being here. I take this um, pretty passionately. This is my job full time. And I, I love working with folks to, to spread the word, do the analysis, get the projects done, and get this moving forward in the right direction. Um, I, I know that some, of, some folks have been active in this realm. Um, how many folks have been uh, active in the hazard mitigation grant planning process? We got one back there. Can you just kind of stand up and tell tell your story a little bit? Yeah. Well, not so much the planning process, but I have a grant under pre-disaster mitigation. Okay. So successful. Halfway there, we're in yeah. the review process. Okay. Now. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, I was working for the city department. We help prepare. We 
prepared for local yeah. plan and a mitigation plan that we need for grants and we're successful. So you were? Yep. Okay, good. I, I remember you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was with another badge. Yes, I, you were. Yeah, no I was time. with a large firm I broke off. Yeah, so was I. <laughs> All right. So good, you were successful. Yes. Great. We did a drainage uh, master plan as part of that project mm -hmm. as well. So um, we were speaking the flood language, the flood control language when we were working with McFarland. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Expectations from you guys. There's not a lot of expectation. My expectation is to give the best feedback you can to us as we move forward. Um, your involvement in this planning process helps guide me do my job and make sure that we can produce the best product we can and we can't do it without your guys' support. But you must be thinking, why am I here? What is all this information? This is a picture from the city of Shasta Lake. And I took it, I looked at the dazed and confused faces <laughs> up there and uh, you know, I, I, that's what I thought in my head. Like, what is this? Why am I here? That's the public works guy. There's the fire department, and that's the that's the electric utility guy on the end. He was he was you know he's doing the GIS as well. So he's thinking GIS. So well, I got more and more on my plate every day. This is an unfunded mandate. However, we need to get through this together. I hope that you still attend and make sure that we can keep this attendance up. And there's reasons why you're here, and I'll go through that today. So Ethan, I got a quick question. Yeah. You mentioned really quickly CERTs. Are we going to go into any more of that? Um, yeah, that's what we'll go into the, the, the requirements for public outreach. OK. OK, and then possibly la at a later date, as we get into the mitigation strategy, how can we communicate with the CERT teams better? What do you need? And what's your plan of attack for that? And so, and why we're doing it. Okay. So we, we're going to do that later. Thank you. Yeah. So I hope that at the end of the day, I hope that you don't have these faces uh, at meeting number four and we're all happy. We're eating donuts. We all have direction together. Um, but uh, I thought this was pretty funny. Um, we want to attend three more meetings. Can you handle that? OK. We need to complete jurisdictional assignments. I understand sometimes these planning processes, another um, planning firm will come out and they'll send out all these forms and you fill out the forms and the plan is done. I don't like doing it that way. It's not meaningful. I don't know. Uh, we don't understand what's going on with the plan. We're just in entering that information from that template and putting it into the plan. I refuse to do that. Uh, I, I, I want to hold the torch high. And I want to make sure that we get better results and activate these plans so you understand why we're doing it first and how, what's the next steps after this plan is done. This is, this is the start of a, of a five-year planning process, a five-year progress report, basically. This is the start. It's not the end. When we finish that plan in a year, that's not the end of this effort. We want to continue to make sure this plan is activated and make sure that you guys can get after that grant money that is plentiful right now. So um, we're going to assist you with public outreach, but I'm going to request that as participating jurisdictions, you help us spread the word. PG&E, you can help us do that. You have a lot of resources out there um, for your arborists, et cetera, how to trim trees. We use the, the, the arborists a lot with PG&E. I have them come to meetings. I have them come to outreach processes. Super important. Um, and that's I really appreciate you guys being here today, but help us spread the word or we can help you spread the word as well. So that's a, it's a, an exchange of ideas and thoughts to reduce that risk out there. And we have different reasons why we're doing it. Um, so that's why you're here today. Spread the word, help us get the information out there, and then we also want to receive information from you. I would like you to review draft documents. Is that, is that hard to do? Review draft documents. OK. And then I think this is the hardest part taking time to educate yourself. I, I'm always pushing our staff to, I have homework assignments where I just sent one out last night. Hey, read this document, it's really cool, it's really interesting. I'm gonna share with it, uh, some of it today. But do your homework, educate yourself. There's plenty of resources out there. We develop mitigate hazards to help you do that. And so I, I challenge you to, to ask questions and educate yourself. Is that hard? Is that impossible? Can you come to meeting two, <laughs> please?
<laughs> Fourth, fifth grade. Okay. So um, there is quite a bit of participating jurisdictions. This is a monstrous planning activity. It, this is going to be very challenging to get these these cats herded to make sure that we're all moving in the same direction. We've got 63 different jurisdictions that are municipalities, water districts. I'm going to review some of this on the website. We have overlapping districts. It's really hard to analyze overlapping districts. Who's responsible for what? Well, we're not even on there. We're on the Mountain Club. And I was wondering when I saw the bathroom, if I were in part of it, because that's the rainbow I want to have Pound Ma Mountain Club is your jurisdiction? Pine, Pine, Pine Mountain Club. OK. Well, I can answer that question after this and see how we can do that. Yeah. So I gave you an overview of what mitigation planning is. There is a process that we need to follow. <coughs> Those are the check boxes. We're all here doing the same thing. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. So I'm going to go through a little bit of that. I don't want to bore you with all of the Code of Federal Regulations, but that's why we're here today. I would like to have you understand some of the the concepts behind what FEMA wants us to do and how we're going to accomplish those, um, those check boxes together. So those are all the federal code of regulations. They scare me sometimes when we have a large audience. We need to make sure that we invite our neighboring jurisdictions, San Bernardino, LA County. We need to make sure that we invite folks that can manipulate <coughs> land, land uses, land codes. We need to invite all everybody in this room. That's why we're here today. We're, we're checking that box, but I think it's an important box. Organizing the resources. We need to assess the, the, the risk. We need to develop mitig a mitigation plan and do plan maintenance. Those are all check boxes that we need to do when we submit the plan. I really don't want you worrying about that. I'll help you get through this process. I really want you to focus in on key elements during these meetings. This meeting is not that difficult. It's more of an informative meeting. But we'll get into some juicy parts later. So we really like to simplify this. This is kind of our graphic as dynamic planning. And the point of this graphic is this stakeholder involvement and strategy, like you mentioned, the CERT teams. When are we going to do that? Well, we're going to educate ourselves first. We never do outreach until we're educated as a group first. That's the first rule, really. I don't want to stumble over my words um, when I'm speaking to the public or speaking to a news agency or a news uh, reporter. So everybody, did you guys get your notebooks? Mm -hmm. This is a cue card in your notebook. I know it's really tight writing. You might need a magnifying glass. But it's also on the website. This is the executive summary and points of contact, etc. If you're going to start talking to the public, or if somebody asks you, hey, what is mitigation planning? You're, you're on your, hey, what did you do for the last two hours? Well, I, I, uh, I reduced risk through uh, the built environment. But um, this is for you guys to understand the project. But it has um, contact information on there, the website, the password, the correct password, current 2020. And all the you know, participating jurisdictions, et cetera. I know it's really small print. It's meant to fit in the notebook. We can only fit so much. But it's all up there on our website. <coughs> so we're going to start to do that digital engagement in this first step. So printed media. We're going to do some surveys. Press releases. We can do face-to-face. -face, and I'll go through that in a bit. But we want to organize our resources before we start doing that engagement. We also want to hear from them, as we, uh, uh, from the public and stakeholders, as we go into that mitigation strategy development. Right? We want to tell them what we're doing. We're going to assess the risk, tell them what the risk is, and then they're going to help us develop that strategy. Now, some of this, that information we're going to give to the public is going to be dummy down. A lot of the information that we're developing is very, very technical. What is replacement cost for, per square foot for buildings? What does um, peak ground acceleration mean? There's, there's technical terms that we'll go through together to, to develop that risk assessment. 
what are ladder fuels, et cetera. I mean, there's so much stuff that goes into these documents that the public may or may not be interested in. But the public may be interested in is how do I strap down my TV for earthquake risk? How do I strap down my bookcases? How do I put in um, fuel resistant material or fire resistant material? Is, is my home at risk to, few, uh, to fires? That's the type of language that we can start helping the public and, and provide more resources. If we don't have the resources now or you have limited resources and financing to do outreach, this is the time to start telling us so we can get this into the mitigation plan and eventually apply for planning grants. <coughs> and then phase four is how, how can we improve the process basically. So phase one, organize the resources. Phase two, we're gonna assess the risk. Phase three, we're gonna develop a mitigation plan. And then phase four, we're gonna implement that plan. We're only here today, phase one. Brian is getting the data ready and getting it together for the risk assessment. We've made quite a bit of progress on that. We have the assessor's roles together. We have a lot of GIS um, put together. And so we're gonna to start to do that process and we're gonna present some of that material during our next meeting. We're gonna present some of that, that risk assessment piece. We have a lot to do between here and here. We're gonna, we are gonna work, you know, I work 40 hour weeks, Brian works 80 hour weeks, I don't know. We're gonna get, we're gonna make sure that it happens in this timeline. This is what we love to do. It's, it's mitigation is simple problem solving. We estimate the impacts, we describe the problem. We're gonna do that together. It's gonna be really cool how we do that. We're gonna assess what resources we have, that's a capabilities assessment. I like to assess the problem before we start assessing the resources. Sometimes folks do it in reverse. Let's assess the resources, and I have all these resources, but maybe half of them won't even be used because the problem doesn't match my resources. So we're gonna, we're gonna assess the problem, <coughs> assess the resources, and come up with objectives and actions. Pretty simple, right? You guys okay? We're gonna slow roll this thing. Let's ask questions. We're good? Okay. Anybody bored yet? You wanna go back to the poll EV? <laughs> okay, so um, phase, here's, here is a Gantt chart. We'll post this up on the website. This is a very simplistic Gantt, Gantt chart. I have a very complicated one. It has all my tasks and milestones, etc. This is a simplified one. But what's important about this is meeting two. 7-18, July 18th, meeting two. That's phase two, we're gonna go over the risk assessment. Our, our third meeting is we're gonna update the mitigation strategy. And then our fourth meeting, we're gonna kind of finalize stuff. Sorry, I didn't notice before, the uh, third meeting is the 19th. September. Oh, we got it wrong again, I'm sorry. We're propagating some bad dates. 19th, September 19th. Oh, I'll, go, I'll, I'll do it right here again. Um, the, the, uh, the second meeting is on um, July 18th. Here's the correct meeting dates right here. So we got a 4th of July-ish meeting, July, summertime. We got, we got a September meeting, September 19th. And then we got a November meeting, November 14th. Is that enough time to plan? I know that we have summer vacations. Please send somebody else if you can attend. I know that you may not be the decision maker for your organization. That is okay. We're gonna build consensus amongst this group and those who are partic formal participating jurisdictions, you're gonna have a little bit different exercises as we go to back to our field offices or our, our offices but it's really important that we continue this attendance and here's our early warning. We're gonna send you tons of information about these meetings. Was the, the way that we sent it out good? Is it too much? No? Okay. Generally what we do is we do a four week notice, but if you can put these on your calendars early right now, that'd be great. We'll do a four week notice, a two week notice, or a one week notice, and then a day before. Please look for that MailChimp thing that might have went into your trash. Please look for Wendy's email. 
her, her email address. I don't know if it went into your trash. Sometimes it does because it's a mass email. So again, these meetings are about two hours, two and a half hours in length. Uh, that's all I can <coughs> handle, really. Unless we're templating stuff. We can sit down for eight hours and get it done. We're gonna template the crap out of this, this document. I don't wanna do that. We wanna go home and do our due diligence and do our homework. But I want to make sure that we have our questions answered in this audience. We've, we've learned. It's not our first rodeo. When we have a large stakeholder audience like this, we can't accomplish the detail that we need to. We need to take home some activities and, and propagate it into our communities. So if I'm a planner at McFarland, I need my public works guy here. I need my my other guys here to help me make decisions, right? I can't do that without those guys on board, but they're, they're, I can't draw that resource from McFarland for two hours because you're gonna have your town be evacuated, <laughs> right? So I, I want to work there. <laughs> Oh, you used to work there? Yeah, no longer. Oh, okay. Um, so what we wanna do is make sure that you can bring back the information and do decision making with a smaller audience. Okay. How about some pull EV? You like that? Let's break it up. <coughs> hey, you already answered that question. Oh yeah, this, no, we haven't answered this one. Did you know that the county had an approved mitigation plan before you got here? <coughs> Hopefully, because Wendy sent out a lot of information about it. <laughs> All right. You guys ready to move on? Okay. Yeah. Did you know that FEMA funds mitigation projects before a disaster strikes? Before today? It's called pre-disaster mitigation, so it's, the acronym is PDM. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. That's good. I'm glad that you guys knew that, but there's an audience here that didn't know that, which is why we're here. Everything good on the... Which holds true for every mitigation dollar spent, how much commonly saved in disaster damage avoidance? How much is co commonly saved for every dollar that you spend ahead of time? There's a study that just came out in 2017. They did a, a formal release of this study. It's called disaster avoidance or losses avoided, I'm sorry. There's <coughs> losses avoided study after every major disaster to see how FEMA is doing with their mitigation program. They study the areas that have, have, have a flooding or wildfire to see what buildings have survived, what buildings were damaged, how, how much damage was there. <coughs> so they're starting to understand how, how, many, how much their dollar is going before the disaster. <coughs> Interesting. You're all wrong. No. <laughs> That's cool. So you think ten dollars? One dollar? One dollar equals ten? Probably for PG and E. Sorry. <laughs> I bet, right? You have some pretty hefty infrastructure out there. Okay. Let's go next. Do you know how much FEMA spends on disasters per year? <coughs> it's going up. Like I said, you see it on the news every day. The polar <coughs> vortex is, uh, there's a lot of scare tactics with, I mean, that watch, make you watch, but there's been a lot of flooding in the Mississippi River Valley this year.
fires. Incredible what's happening out there. Santa Rosa before paradise. But they're rebuilding in those neighborhoods right now. In the same pads. Just started. Yep. They can't go anywhere else. They can't afford it. All right. Next. Did you hear that uh, President Trump signed a Disaster Reform Act last year? The DDRA? This is actually a really good bill. It, it, uh, after the wildfires, we're now able to do more mitigation and during wild or after wildfire events. There's a lot more funding for mitigation after this act was signed. They were changing the threat. We, we can do more analysis now with mitigation dollars. Whereas before we had to do hard projects, it's opening up the, the opportunities to do things like this or GIS analysis on properties that are, have high fuel exposure. <coughs> It was a pretty good bill. Sometimes things go unnoticed. All right. That's, that's it. You like that? You guys like full EV? You want to do it again? Okay. I'm going to. Yeah. <laughs> that's it, guys. Go home. <laughs> Gonna leave you wondering. The question from you two. B R I C. Can you please? Read? Yeah. Does, does anybody know what B R I C <coughs> is? The acronym USACE is asking about. Okay. I don't know. I can't answer if I don't know what the acronym means. I'll let you know if I get a response. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go a little bit through some dry material. If you might want to get some water, please do so. Coffee, donuts. But um, FEMA spends approximately $22.7 billion a year. Isn't that crazy? And it's continuing to escalate. There's, a, there's been a disaster declaration in every state, including Puerto Rico. We're, we're footing the bill. And we're going bankrupt on the NFIP right now. The National Flood Insurance Program cannot sustain the amount of uh, activity and the, the amount of damage that's happening across the United States. We can't sustain this kind of activity or we can't sustain this kind of natural events, n natural disaster events. This does not include in the insurance agencies or other agencies. This is just FEMA. That's crazy, right? I think it's like 1% of GDP. It costs us about $306 billion in 2017, natural disasters. We really need to get ahead of the game here. Yeah. So we're, we're looking to reduce cost through mitigation. They're starting to understand that. Uh, we can do that through pre-disaster, PDM, FMA, and HM, HMGP. I'm only gonna speak to these this program, because that's the intent of this planning process. There's tons more programs out there, USDA, um, CDBG dollars, CDBG disaster dollars. I'm only gonna speak to the program and the program intent today. So if we have other questions, if you know of other programs that would help us do d disaster mitigation and buy down that risk, we're, we'll, we'll do that during the mitigation strategy. So these are some new graphics. These infographics are coming out from FEMA. The source is um, down here. But for every dollar spent, it saves six dollars on future disasters. Now that, that, you guys are all right. There's different types of uh, spending for earthquake versus wildfire versus um, flood risk, etc. I'm gonna go through that a little bit. But for right now, for every dollar spent, on average, you can save six dollars in the rear from disasters.
disaster, um, natural disasters. And this report came out in 2017 from the National Institute of Building Science. It's a really well received report. It gives us kind of some stats. I really uh, hope that you would read it. It's kind of flashy, it has good graphics, lots of pictures. Here's kind of the breakdown of the, the spending. So the, the, they break it down in this report a couple different ways. You can either tighten your building codes and require more, more um, resiliency through building codes. So riverine flooding, getting your basements out of the flood, or getting your mechanical equipment, <laughs> regulating to a higher standard, will save you, <coughs> will save you $5 for every dollar spent. Hurricane surge, I know that we don't have that here, but wind, we have Santa Ana winds here. So getting your building codes to make sure that we, it could withstand, some of your buildings could withstand higher winds, five to one ratio. Earthquake, four to one. Wildfire interface, four to one. That's just building codes. Yeah, national building codes, yep. Now, we look at the mitigation side. That's the, federal, the feds, FEMA, funding mitigation. Seven to one for flooding. Five to one for wind, three to one, and three to one for wildfire. So that's retrofitting a building for earthquake or wind or, earthquake, or, or wildfire. We're seeing significant savings on the back end. Anybody have any questions? Pretty cool graphics, right? I like them. They're not mine. <laughs> so this is kind of what, uh, what we're speaking to when we're, we're, we're talking about tighter building codes for flooding. We want to get that mechanical equipment above the base flood elevation. We, might, we want to make sure, here's an example. I, I showed this to a lot of folks. But when, when flooding occurs, there's more damage at a three foot level than versus a six inch level. Do you guys know why? Outlets, mechanical equipment. M a lot of people put their computers on the floor. So we want to get that mechanical equipment above that base flood elevation and so that's mitigation. That's a seven to one savings if we can do it before the flooding occurs. That same picture that I showed you from Solano County, we walked their whole site, the public works yards and everything, and it floods often. I look down and I see all the computers on the floor. The outlets are high, but the computers are on the floor. I'm like, why didn't you guys move your computers up? That's, that's mitigation. Seven to one. That's even, that's even probably more than that, 20 to one, if I just move my computer and do this to save my computer from failing. Wildland and Urban Interface. Got, yeah, I think it has since this report. This report came out in 2017. Paradise is probably going to be a good example. They're going to do a losses avoided study there, if, not, if, they, if they haven't done it already. Yeah. So we, we can see that um, the benefit cost ratios go up in California. Property values are really high here. We have a lot of wildfire here, so we can study it more often and understand the benefit cost ratios in these areas. That's pretty cool, right? We're starting to understand our, our benefit from, from this uh, mitigation planning and med mitigation. Four to one, three to one. Four to one with building codes, if we can build to a higher standard, we can really save some coin in the back end after an earthquake. Um, do you guys, under, do you know what the Field Act is? Anybody? After uh, some very strong earthquakes in, in Long Beach in 1933, some schools were <coughs> damaged. And schools are regulated to a higher building code and building standards than IBC. <coughs> They're some of the most safe buildings in the, in the, in the United States is uh, public school system buildings in California are some of the safest in the world. It's as a result of tighter building codes. So four to one for building codes, three to one for Bracing bolt programs. So it depends on when your house was built. But building codes have been up, up, upgraded every time there's a major earthquake. We learn from those disasters. And we start to upgrade the IBCs and, and national building codes to reflect 
the weaknesses in buildings. And so depending upon when your, your house's home was built, it may be built to different standards as, as uh, compared to now. And we can, we can mitigate that risk through upgrading the existing structures that have been built to lesser standards to, to current day standards. So that's mitigation for earthquake. Three to one. A lot of times um, what happens in, in earthquakes that are fairly mild, um, in Plumas County they had a 5.7. And the, the way that that earthquake happened is that it had a lot of um, vibrations, short wave vibrations, and it, it <coughs> toppled chimneys. They had a $1.7 million worth of chimney damage in Plumas County. They, it happened right at the base of Almanar Dam. The dam didn't get damaged because it was built to a certain standard to withstand that kind of earthquake, but a lot of homes got damaged. It's just their chimneys, though. So we can do outreach for that to reduce that damage. $1.7 million was uncovered be, because most of those homes were second homes for folks. So we can, we can definitely help the public save some coin out before an earthquake by doing proper outreach, understanding, you know, hey, um, you can do the brace and bolt program, which is bracing down your, your home to your foundation. A lot of homes weren't done like that um, before 1978. Okay. In FY 2018, this is how much was spent in mitigation. Isn't that crazy? $930 million spent in mitigation across the country. This is what we're trying to attack here. We want this money. I like other people's money. I like the Fed's money. I bet Kern County likes the Fed's money, right? <laughs> it's hard to get. There's a lot of strings attached. There's a lot of process to go through. Pre-disaster mitigation grant program dollars. $57.7 million across the country. That's before disaster strikes. That's available every year, regardless of any kind of disaster. No, normally the, the notice of intent or NOFOs come out in October in California. We can apply for this every year. I hope to be applying for this PDM dollars next year. Every one of us should be thinking about that as participating jurisdictions. We're going to knock on their door, <laughs> knock on their door, and knock on their door again and again and again. It's not that hard to do. It's not that hard to get your foot in the door for the 6%. The flood mitigation assistance program dollars is specifically aimed at flood mitigation. So moving those homes, repairing the floodplain, repairing your drainage structures, making sure that we can accommodate the 100-year floodplain. So that program is $88.2 million. I know we have repetitive loss in this community. I don't know if we have a severe repetitive loss, but we have structures that have been damaged twice in the, uh, over a 10-year period in Kern County. I don't know how many. I, you, I think it's 133. I think it's 133 properties have been damaged and re-damaged. Is that I don't, private? I'm sorry. Is that private property no. or is that public? Oh, no, that's private property. That, that, those are individuals buying flood insurance and getting repetitively damaged. There's a, I think there's 133 repetitive damage properties here in Kern County. That includes the municipalities. So that's, that's that pot of money. We can go after that as soon as this plan is approved and done. And then we have this big pot, the, the HMGP pot. That's post-disaster mitigation dollar. Or basically after a disaster, there's a pot of money that opens up for mitigation. If it's pre presidentially declared in California, if it was a wildfire in paradise, we can apply for flood mitigation assistance here locally. It doesn't, the, the color of disaster does not need to match. This pot of money is fairly significant across the United States, especially in California. We just had five disasters this year in 2019. We've had 100 disasters since 2012 in, that, in California. Twenty nineteen five. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy town. We haven't seen this. 
Here's how it's the, this program is spread across the United States. We've had 122 projects of, um, approved and implemented in California. And I'm sorry, in Region 9. So Region 9 is, is California, Nevada, Arizona, and Hawaii. So we're in Region 9, obviously. We've worked across um, multiple regions. They're all the same. We have a unified program. It's called Hazard Mitigation Assistance. There's a unified document. We have to do things all the same across the United States to get after this grant program and these applications, these notice of intent. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. How are we doing? Are you guys okay? We're like, we're going into high school right now. <coughs> Two hundred and eighty projects. This is um, Texas and California are some of the most disaster-prone states in the nation. I think California now beat Texas for disaster declarations. We have three hundred and five in California. I think Texas is around two hundred and seventy or something like that. Of all, all the hurricanes, etc. We're pretty exposed here too. Earthquake country, wildfire country, flood country. I like California, but sometimes it's scary to live here. You always see it in the news, and especially Region uh, 7 as well, Mississippi River Valley. Any questions? Yeah. There's a lot of words, <laughs> but uh, this is that Disaster Recovery um, Act that was signed. That was it signed just last year. So um, greater investment in, in mitigation before a disaster, ding. That's great. Uh, when I saw that, I, I jumped up and down. Wildfire prevention. So these are funding activities that have been increased since uh, after the signing of that act. Again, we have these slides available on uh, our website. Pretty cool, right? We're starting to pay attention. That's what I really like to see is that the people are in the right place at the right time doing the right signatures. So here's that mitigation, uh, <laughs> that unified guidance. I'm gonna help you guys navigate this guidance, but here's some of the colors of money in that guidance. There's the HMGP funding mechanisms. That's the um, after uh, post-disaster. So anything in orange you see, like this symbol right here, that means post-disaster, okay, the, on these slides. And then we have pre-disaster, so the blue. So these two pots of money, the PDM and FMA, are pre-disaster activities. And then we have HMGP, which is post-disaster. This is all under the unified guidance that comes out and it gets refreshed every so often. We have to, buy, this is our Bible to go by when we apply for grants. If I get a question, hey, can we do this? I go to this Bible. Can we do this? Uh, let me go look. Can we do this? Nah, this is kind of on the borderline. You might be able to do it under the 5% initiative. There's a 5% initiative in here that's kind of like a catch-all. So again, the orange, I'm gonna not go over 406. That gets a little complicated. But you can do mitigation with certain pots of money for, for instance, if this building were, was to be in an earthquake and half of it was damaged and half of it wasn't, you can use 406 money to mitigate and rebuild better on this half of the building and then you can use HMGP for, to, to seismic retrofit the building that hasn't been damaged on the other side. So it's a blending of money, it's really complicated. But what I want you to realize is that there's different pots pre-disaster and post-disaster. The funding is limited by the disaster in these locations and then hazard mitigation assistance. Funding is available only for non-damaged facilities on the pre-disaster. Is that, is that cool? You guys okay? This is a really, I, I, I lose a lot of people in here but it's really, really important to realize the intent of this program we, I have glossed over this stuff, and then we get to the end, and I say, well, this, this project, this project is not gonna fly. This one isn't gonna fly. This one isn't gonna fly. This is not even mitigation. 
So it's really go, good to go back to the basics, the intent of the program before we start implementing a plan and a strategy and actions that are aimed at this grant, grant funding program. So on pre-disaster mitigation, the cost share is typically 75, 25%. I like that. <laughs> I'd rather pay for 25% of my car, right? Must be consistent, the, the projects must be consistent with your hazard mitigation plan for pre-disaster. When, it, when, it, when they say consistent, it's kind of a loose term. It either has to be identified as a particular project. Hey, we're gonna seismic retrofit this EOC. That's all we need to put uh, down as a statement or it needs to meet an objective or a goal, the project. So it must be consistent. It's really easy to have consistency with a project or a planning project to make sure that we align it. If we're really loose with our goals, we're gonna upgrade all public facilities to withstand earthquakes. Well, it, it meets that goal, an objective, or, or meets that particular project. Must meet cost-effective requirements. The EOC, how much was it to build? Uh, well, let's just say a billion dollars. I don't know, a million dollars, yeah. right? <coughs> yeah. If the retrofitting costs $1.5 million, that's not cost effective. It's not going to meet the BCA, the benefit cost analysis requirements. It's, the funding for PDM for these blue pots and FMA is available annually. Like I said, every October, we're going to go after that. Boom, boom. I want to see tons of applications from this from this group every year. I don't care if, it, if it's not complete yet, we get after it. We get in the door every time. And then provides um, planning projects too, so we can do risk assessments, risk analysis. This is really cool, I didn't know this. Um, we, can, we can fund building code updates. Yes. If you're wishing to do a building code refresh or update, that's gonna help reduce damage or help reduce the potential injuries in the community, this is that pot of money, PDM. We're right now, um, we're after some um, targets of updating the safety elements of general plans. We applied for some of those and we got approved. So planning projects, kind of cool, right? I, I started to be become more fascinated when I knew that you can update your building codes because there's a, there's a strong tie between going back to this, you know, your building codes. You're saving way more money with building codes than you are with physical projects. There's a tie to that. The PDM dollars are competitive though. We're competing on a national level. We're competing at a regional level. They're hard, it's hard to get projects done. There's approximately $750,000 for planning projects in California every year. So planning, that's code updates. Planning projects like this, it's, yeah, it is discretionary. It can be funded by the state or, or federally awarded. They're, they're prioritized through um, the, the local jurisdiction. So the state will prioritize PDM projects. They'll rack and stack them the they, they way that they foresee their, the intent of their program, the state's program. They look how well you're doing with your mitigation plan. They look at how well you're doing with your building codes. There's a building code, um, C, it's, what's the acronym? <coughs> Oh, I forget the acronym. Um, it rates your, your building codes as a city. And it helps insurance. ISO? No, it's BCGS, I think. BGCS? B, what's it? CBGES or something. I forget what it is. But there's a rating for your building codes. And the insurance, act, like ISO ratings for your fire departments, there's one for your building codes. Yep. And so the, the insurance industry responds to these ratings, and they set your insurance rates based upon these building codes as well as your ISO codes. Yeah. So the, the California, uh, Cal OES takes a look at all of that information when you're going into a planning project for PDF. 
So you're judged before you're judged. We want to make sure that we can tell a good story. As we go through this planning process, I'm going to tell the good stories. Even though that you did maybe did not activate your annexes or your plans, I'm going to tell them a good story. Hey, you know, you did those culvert upgrades. I'm going to take credit for that. Um, you did some wildfire outreach, or def uh, you know, you did defensible space outreach. We're going to take credit for that. Sorry, we're going to use it for the next time, right? We want to we want to be do-gooders. Um, we'll go, we'll skip this one for now. I feel as though we can go we can go to this slide on the website, but this is mostly about that FMA, that flood insurance program stuff. We do not have a lot of policies and a lot of losses here, but um, I'll skip this for now. Do you want me to go on it? Anybody interested? Any floodplain administrators here? No. Anybody interested in flood damage? Do you want me to stay on this slide? No. No, I've skipped the foundation, like I mentioned before, and then we lose. Why are we doing this? Why am I here? I'm just here to eat donuts. And I, I really want to make sure that we're all paying attention to these activities because it's different than EMPG. It's different than a lot of the USDA grants that are out there. Um, but this one is specifically, there's a lot of money for the FMA, so we don't want to ignore it. $88.2 million per year is spent <coughs> in FMA, flood, flood by basically flood re uh, risk reduction. That includes structural projects, again, moving homes. I'm going to put this slide in here just for you guys to click on the links. This will be available. This is um, all the categories. And if you need a, a local hazard mitigation plan for each one of these, you don't need it for AI, PA, but you do need it for HMGP. You need an approved plan in place. So I'm gonna, this is going to be a, a resource for you. I'm not going like, to um, sit here and stall on this slide. But these are all clickable links. It goes to the actual programs and the intent of the programs. So here's some flood mitigation examples. This is acquisition, or, or um, I'm sorry, um, elevation of a structure. That's flood <coughs> mitigation. You can't use FEMA. FMA dollars or HMGP to uh, acquire vacant land. You can acquire the land, remove the home that's being damaged multiple times, or structures or infrastructure, <coughs> and, and, and in perpetuity let it be floodplain. But we can't rebuild in that location. We can't acquire vacant land. So here's a demonstration project. This is a rain garden, they called it. There was a home here that was being damaged multiple times. Um, we acquired that project, or we acquired that home, converted it to open space and, let it, and uh, let it be a rain garden. So this is how it, the activity, the flood activity happened in this on this particular home in this neighborhood. The home was getting repetitively damaged over and over and over again. Isn't that crazy? Just one home on a block. Isn't that cool? So that's mitigation. This, I just want you to think about what mitigation is. I'm going to give you some examples. Here's an elevation project after DR 1453. This is in Ohio. So we elevated the structure. It used to be down here. We, we bumped it up. The first floor elevation is now here, about 14 feet higher than it used to be. They had significant flooding up and probably to the window sills at almost on a dec decadal basis. Right, so this is elevation. So there's other flood proofing methods. 
So floodgates, like I mentioned before, there's flood proofing methods that can be done. Good for minor flood flooding. Getting your backflows up above the flood zone is really good. Stormwater retention basins. We can't transfer the problem downstream. We can build this fantastic straight shot flood control structure that's going to end up impeding folks downstream. We can't do that as part of this. It's called no adverse impact. So we can't cause problems downhill, right, with, these, with this program. I bet a lot of folks are interested in this today, wildfire mitigation, defensible space. And I just found this out, too. Sprinkler systems for wildfire. I'm a, oh, go ahead. Yeah, the structural improvement to get that water away. Yeah, yeah that's that's mitigation because eventually you're gonna get you're gonna, you're gonna fill that basin or whatever place, and it's gonna spill over, and you're not gonna have that pump at some point, right? Okay, so mitigation would not be buying a bigger pump. Right? They don't fund bigger pumps. They would fund a, a structural improvement to mitigate that risk. A long-term action. Not a bigger pump. Yeah. Not, a, a, not a, um, a generator that can move on wheels. That's equipment, right? So we need long-term solutions. Um, we, we do, they do a lot of um, generator replacement programs. So if this EOC had a generator or did not have a generator, and it's attached to the structure physically and, and uh, secured, that is mitigation. But sprinkler systems, for I'm a, um, a fire suppression engineer, it needs to have its, um, its own water source. So if you're pumping from a lake and you continue to pump for a lake for 48 hours, you can get uh, fire sprinkler systems for wildfire installed. But you need to have a constant source of water. It can't be just a you know, cistern that has 500 gallons in it. That's not going to suppress a wildfire for a home. You're, you're going to need thousands of gallons over a period of 48 hours, and it kicks on automatically when the wildfire approaches. We don't have that kind of water here in California. It's mostly aimed at the Great Lakes area, et cetera. So if you have an idea, let's start scoping it. Look at your old mitigation plan. We'll go through this later. but. What we want to do is we want to front load, like M Wendy was alluding to, we want to front load these projects. We want to front load them to make them easier to uh, get that money. That's the point of this process, too, is front loading the planning process and getting to the project applications. Here's some front loading steps, but we scope it, we develop the project, we, we go to the application process award, and then project close out. But we really want to front load that project. <coughs> We, uh, we can address program eligibility as we get closer to the end of this process. We can address the eligibility. So any idea that you have, let's just start writing it down. We got a gap here. We have, we have I want to do mitigation. I want to do defensible space. I want to do more outreach. I want to do a chipper program. All that stuff could be funded. <coughs> oh yeah, like putting, on, putting it somewhere on this. Oh, start jotting down your ideas in your notebooks. That's what they're there for. Don't give them to your grandkids. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna jump to the website real quick and show you some of the features of our website. We got. Uh, bear with me. We got 20 minutes. Can we hang in there? Cool. So have you been to this website yet? It's on your computers. I hope that you can follow along, click along. We're almost done with high school graduation. And so we land everybody here. This is a resource that has been developed since San Bernardino County. We came up with this concept. 
every time we do a project, we're funded by the government and we give the materials back to the government and say, here, do as you wish with them. We have been developing this website on the backbones of other projects. Every time we have a new project, we, we kind of gather more information, provide more resources. So this is uh, a, a resource that we developed for projects like yours. So we have why have a plan, planning process. There's a lot of resources. There's a FEMA tool is pretty cool. You can go to that one. If you want to find out more about disasters in your area or your county, there's a cool interactive tool where you can see the amount of disasters in each county, when it happened, how it happened. And it's very clickable. You go and scroll down, you can see the flood. You can and, and it sorts and racks and stacks based upon the type of hazards. So if you go to fire, there's been 15 fires that have been declared FMA disasters, fi fire management assistant that disasters. And then you can click on each one of the disasters to find out more about each one. Pretty cool, right? It's, got, it's a cool FEMA tool. We're allowed to consume it. Um, there is a form up here. We're starting to reactivate that form. If you have questions, please ask the form. If you have questions for us, questions for this planning process, or just in general about um, where Brian lives. <laughs> where do you live, Brian? Concord. Um, so we can, uh, we can answer questions through a form, which is really cool because if, if we have the same question, it can be answered once. Um, and then we go to the individual project information. This is where the part we're going to ask you to help us propagate this information, copy and paste it if you need to. I looked at the, some of the major cities' websites last night, Bakersfield, Tehachapi, I, I hope that you consume this information while we're updating this because you have a, a, a key element in the plan and it would be good to inform the public that you're making progress to updating your mitigation plan. You can grab this content. The executive summary is yours. You can grab it, repost it onto your websites. We can help you do that and we will help you do that. Um, we'll have a jurisdictional <laughs> lead for everybody. We'll, we'll be assigning jurisdictional leads as soon as we settle down on who's participating, who isn't. A planning staff member will be a jurisdictional lead, will be assigned to you. A water district will be assi assigned to um, each individual staff member that we have. A school district. You'll each have a, a lead that will help you through this process. I really hope that we can help you get more information up on your websites. And we'll help you do that. Go ahead and scroll down. If you're more interested on the footprints of where each of these districts are or municipalities are, we have a map. So we have all the footprints. It took quite a while to get these. LAFCO didn't even have them. So now you can discover where each school district is, where each water district is. Kind of kind of cool. This is setting up the risk assessment for a later date. We're going to show a portal that has mapping capabilities and we'll be able to see how many structures are in this water district. How many structures are at high wildfire risk in this district. So we'll have that capability later. But this kind of sets up the tone. Okay. And then we have the project portal um, where we have meetings and stakeholder coordination. So this is the password protected piece to this website. Please click along. You can upload documents. We're gonna, you may have a fairly large document that's over 20 megs or something. You can upload it. Um, and then we'll, at a later date, we'll have hazard mapping. That's going to be a, a risk assessment tool. It's set up now. You're gonna be a, there's a password protection on that one as well. Same password, Kern2040. Please do not give this to Fox <laughs> News. Of <laughs> uh, 2020. Kern2020. Sorry. And so this is kind of what we're working on right now. You're going to have this awesome tool to show you and filter 
what your wildfire risk, what's your population, et cetera, in each area, uh, under each district. So you're going to be able to filter your risk and see what's going on out there and kind of do your own vulnerability assessment, not dependent upon us. I really want to coach you on how to look at things in a different light and how we look at it. And you're going to have the same ability to do that once we're done with this process. Pretty cool, right? Does anybody have it online right now? You do? So you can filter by the municipality. And we, are, we already started to unlock the, some of the features. We'll go through that next meeting. We'll be more intense into this product next meeting, basically. It's really draft right now. Uh, please do not share this with the public right now. What I say about messaging, we got to have that messaging with the pieces that come with this. We don't want to show folks their risk and say, this is your bona fide risk. This is, you're, you're going to lose your home. That's the wrong messaging. <laughs> so uh, again, that's really important when we do that. Um, so we have parcels, we have population, and we can sort, rack, and stack the way we need to to look at each participating jurisdiction. Now we we do have we we omitted national for gov federal lands off of this because we're focusing in on the assets that we could affect or the the land use codes that we can manipulate. Whereas you we might have a continuation into what you're doing into your shaded fuel breaks or I forget the term of that where we have a consistent planning process between private property and federal lands. We can I, I, there's a term for it BLM has it but. Um, we can start to help each other do mitigation where it makes sense. So this gives us a, a, a window into where the populations are within high wildfire <coughs> risk areas. Uh, the, the water districts might be interested in where the flood risk is for their users or their connections. PG&E, you might be interested in where, I mean, you probably do this analysis. Oh, oh they did? Okay. <laughs> I'll pick on them then. Um, but um, we'll be able to use this for different types of reasons for different folks. Okay. Uh, meeting, oh yeah, the meeting materials up here too. <coughs> so we have meet, uh, meeting number two, or one up here already. There's the live stream, and then we have the PowerPoint presentation there on, under meetings. We're recording this right now. And you, you'll have the voiceover with the slides uh, when this is over. Pretty cool, right? So if, if you miss something, please go back to this location. And you might want to tell your CERT um, buddies about this, right? Come back to one of your CERT meetings. You can, you're more than welcome to take anything off of this page. OK? Any questions about the website? OK. Let's uh, go back. Let's do a pull EV thing. Um, but we'll, let's go back to the PowerPoint. I want to show you something real quick. And then we're going to finalize here in about 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to do a quick five minute review of the current plan. In the current plan, we have a number of different hazards that have been identified and profiled. They include earthquake, floods, wildfire, dam failure, drought, insect hazards, landslides, natural hazard health hazards, severe weather, soil ha hazards, and volcanoes. That's a pretty la big laundry list of items. Did anybody do any kind of volcano mitigation over the last five years? <laughs> Never get money for that. <laughs> Never get money for that. <laughs> so sometimes we, what we'll do as, uh, during our next meeting, we'll make decisions on whether, hey, you know what? Over the last five years, we really didn't do a good job of attacking the, the prevalent hazards. Why am I, why am I including all the, the small time hazards in the area? I really just want to attack the more, more prevalent ones. We're allowed to, to swipe these off the, 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 the plan to make sure that we can concentrate our resources and efforts together. So we can take another swipe at this and say, hey, you know what? It's 2019, I've had five disasters in Kern County in 2019 with that are flood related. No, I'm, 
I'm saying that's, that's what it could be over the next five years and what we really need to do is pay attention to some of the more prevalent hazards. So we'll take another look at this. I'm gonna you're going to help me do that today with this pull EV. There is a larger universe of hazards out there. So here's what's identified in the Kern County HMP, right? We got the Kern County General Plan. They identify these hazards. So we do a crosswalk of hazards to see what everybody else is talking about, right? So we got the San Bernardino Plan. We talk about climate change, drought, earthquake, and floods, and wildfires. <coughs> so we don't talk about soil hazards, insect hazards, volcanoes in San Bernardino. We don't have to. And then we have the LA County HMP. They don't talk about volcanoes or insect hazards in theirs. So we might want to take a, another look at this. Make sure we can streamline our resources, streamline what we're attacking so we, we're not dispersing on different types of distractions. We're, we're disaster prone. 305 federally declared disasters in California. 102 since 2012. Five in 2019 across California. That's crazy <coughs> amount of disasters. We're a big state though. Kern County's disaster prone, right? We've had 32 disasters declared in Kern County since 1953. Our last one was in 2016, locally. Most of them have been wildfire related. So here's, uh, oh, I must have missed that slide. The last um, wildfire was, um, the oh, was it? Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> yes, yeah, Cedar. I apologize. I apologize. Um, so we had, we were, since 2011, this is the last listed disaster in our 2012 plan. And so you can see we, we have a continuation of wildfire and flooding. Right? What do we want to attack in this plan? You're going to help me out today. Mitigation strategy. Goal one was reduce the impacts to citizens. Reduce the impacts to existing and future development. So those are those global statements that help us align our applications. But we might have specific projects in there as well. Strengthen multi-jurisdictional coordination. This may not be a funded activity, but we're doing that now. We're strengthening our coordination. So th there was five goals in the, in the 2012 plan. I think they're really good. We don't need to edit every piece of the plan. We're just editing some pieces of it. I would like to really look at the profiles and see how we describe them. We're going to do a better risk assessment. <coughs> we may look at the list of hazards again, maybe Maybe streamline the plan a little bit. But we got to do it together as a group. I can't go in as a consultant and say, this section's gone. This hazard's gone. We got we to make consensus uh, as a group. Okay, let's, let's do our last pull EV exercise. I want you to ra rack and stack the hazards as the, you perceive them as a threat that are currently in the plan right now. <laughs> Oh, no, we go to the next one. We'll skip, uh, we're going to skip a few. Okay, do that drag operation that you did with the giraffe and zebra and lion. I want you to rack and stack the hazards that you see as the most prevalent on top. And then the secondary most, uh, in your perception, uh, your individual perception, this is not your agency's perception but your individualized perceptions <laughs> as a group. This is going to help us as a team start to look at these in a different fashion. We're going to do it again in a different exercise, but this gives us the ability to focus.
Can we answer the the bio, um, USACE's question? Um, Can we do it? Okay, just so you guys know, we had a question come in from USACE, the United States Army Corps of Engineers, and there's a new program out that they have, and we'll send you more information about that. They're looking for public comment, and um, uh, we'll send out more information regarding um, the, that acronym BRIC, uh, the Building Resilient Infrastructure in Communities. Um, it will focus on reducing the nation's risk by funding public infrastructure projects that increase communities resilience before a disaster. So again, more mitigation focus from the core, and they're looking for comment on such from folks like us. So we'll send that out, and um, thank you uh, for whoever posted that to us. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it was pretty obvious from that list of what is active out there, but I just yeah. want to get a general sense. I mean, um, you know, soil hazards was mentioned um, when, uh, during our kickoff meeting. We have some uh, land in Kern County that has been, um, has re reduced the ag, um, basically infrastructure on the land, and it's kind of dried up, and the soils have been ex expandable or collapsible in the areas as well. So we have some soil issues. In the, in the area, and the general plan safety element might address those, but we should be consistent between planning efforts. You guys okay? You guys agree with these? Obviously, it's a polling. It gives us a good general sense of where we're going to be heading with this plan and how we're going to attack it. Do you have any questions right now? What are some of those bottom hazards? Do we have a volcano? I think Kern County. I'm not, do we have a volcano in Kern County? We don't have a volcano in Kern County, is my understanding, but there is one, I think, in Neal County. Yeah. That is not a volcano. Okay. Mammoth Lakes, yeah. yeah. Mammoth Lakes is okay. There was a report that came out, I read it, is about all the hazardous volcanoes in California. And there, there's one in Napa, actually, that's um, up by Lake Berryessa. There's a bunch of things yeah. going to the desert. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we'll look at it. And <laughs> we'll give you more information as we go through this and so we can make an educated choice. <coughs> Anybody have any questions or other housekeeping items? <coughs> can we do something better? Is this, was this uh, germane to what we needed to do today? Was this the right level? Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to bore anybody, but we, I would like to lay this foundation. We'll get it more exciting as we move forward. Uh, we just, we gotta wait till we have the information too. We're, we're really, we can only work so fast. Um, this will be recorded, it's recorded. We're recording it now. It was live streamed. Uh, I think that worked really <coughs> well. The um, two options I think we'll give in the future is our screen share and live video recording. Uh, and then we'll make that available after. Um, please do not forget about these meetings. Oh, that was good. Can you put these on your calendars? Please, please.
why is it not? Let's go back through the meeting dates again, just in case. Lots of information. Ready to go. Okay. July 18th. Oh, we're going to send out meeting notices, like the quick ones? Yeah, I'll send out appointments. Yeah. So people can have a calendar. Okay. And then they'll follow along with the uh, meeting notices. Okay. I do realize it's summertime. I know that you guys go on travel with your kids and stuff like that, grandkids, etc. But Yeah, same. I, I think the same time works, right? 9 o'clock? Uh, yeah. Is this okay here? September 19th and November. If we're fast tracking this planning effort, but we'll, we'll probably be more, uh, the lead time will be longer on the drafting of the technical information into a document that we can fulfill um, all the check boxes with. Um, there's just one bit of information here I would like to show you guys before we leave. I wanted to talk about just the outreach process real quick. We're, we're required to, to come together as a group. We're required to have the public comment on our strategy. And then we're, we're required to have the public comment on our final plan. Those are the three pieces. And we'll help you do all of this. But I wanted to make sure that you knew that we need to have them comment on the strategy development and the final plan. We're already checking the box by being here together and coordinating as a group for the first element. Um, I'm sorry, for the, this uh, 2016B2, we're, we're checking the box for that one, but we, we still need to check the boxes for reaching out and getting this plan out there and hearing from them as we develop the strategy. And we'll do that through a lot of information. We'll develop a lot of the heavy lift. We'll work out deals with Still and do some product giveaways and stuff like that. We'll incentivize the information gathering from the public, it really works. We just got done doing this in Napa. We had over a 1,000 survey results. Um, we have over 200 survey results for the school district already. We just launched it on Monday. So we'll incentivize. So if you can think about incentives that you've done in your agencies that have worked, please let us know, email me. Um, but this really does work. A $300 still voucher is awesome to, as an incentive to do a survey. Uh, we did first 50 surveys, get earthquake straps. We've done all kinds of stuff. If you have ideas that work, please let us know. And email me, please. It really helps. It really helps getting the public involved. And we need to do this early to get it start, get, uh, set up. We need to set this up early. <coughs> and uh, I think that's it. I think we're ready to go. I think you're ready to think about mitigation, right? Nixle. Every Nixle. 
kit. Um, you know, to just kind of think outside the box. Think, you know, you, you don't have to reinvent anything, but, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity out there uh, to take advantage of. There, we have a publication in my local county. I wrote an article for it, put a bunch of pictures together, and did, did an advertisement like this in there. And it was a pretty slick document that I didn't have, we didn't have to pay for. It was already being done by the county. Any, any kind of publications that are being done, we can write articles for and, and curtail it to your audience. And so we do that all the time. We write articles. We'll do you know, a, a quick media blurb that can be used on Facebook. We'll, we'll attach pictures with it, and we'll, we'll, we'll release it in a package for you guys, like a media package, basically. Yeah, the toolkit, like you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. 90, so the, you're 98% of the way there with what's yeah. provided, I think. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so we've started to learn from that. We've gotten really good responses lately. We've spent a lot of time and effort doing these public outreach events, and like Wendy alluded to, that we get 12 people. We can piggyback on opportunities like Preparedness Day or, or uh, Sidewalk CPR Day. We can, we can have the same and similar topics. It may not be mitigation. Sidewalk CPR is not mitigation, but you get the same interested audiences that care about their communities. So think about those events, too, where we can piggyback onto that. All we're asking for is a survey. What are your thoughts on mitigation? What are you doing at your home now? What would incentivize you to do mitigation in your home? This is what the county is doing to help themselves. How can we help you help, you help yourself? Um, that's kind of that outward and inward approach. Um, so they want us to do both. When I say they, the state, Cal OES, FEMA, they want us to do this inward look and this outward look too. How are we protecting our residents? And how are we protecting our own assets? And we should be doing that um, as a group. I think that's it. I think, I think we're good. I think we're good for today. We're graduated from high school. We're going to go into college next meeting. <laughs> I mean, say goodbye to your parents. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, if you have any questions, please come up and I can answer them. Um, thank you for all the guys online. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Oh, okay, it's not, you're on the sign-in sheet? Okay. Can you just circle yourself then, just to make sure that we get you on the list? Are you here somewhere? Right here. Right here. Please sign in if you haven't signed.